Well, it's a great pleasure to have with me today uh, Wally Inch um, from the Salu Scouts. As we all know, the Salu Scouts was an exceptionally tough unit. And uh, I think I, it's safe to say Wally was one of the, the toughest of the tough. And I know uh, he was much loved and respected by his late commander, Ron Reed Daly, who uh, held Wally in, in terribly high esteem. Um, so Wally, thanks very, very much for finding the time to talk to me today. Um, and I just want you to start, just tell us a little bit about um, your early life and your journey through life to where you ended up in, this, in, in the Army and in the Salu Scouts. Okay, uh, Hannes, um, I'll go back to about the, my early school days, which weren't really school days, because um, there wasn't a school where I was sort of, in, it, just after the war, my dad had left the Royal Navy in South Africa, in, in Simonstown, and decided he was recruited. Well, there was a big recruiting campaign going on for guys who, um, just after the war, yeah. um, to go to Rhodesia. <laughs> and he was a Scotsman in right. the Royal Navy. And he decided to take a, this up, and he decided to go to, to Rhodesia, to work with the Rhodesian Railways. Right. So, um, I, I, I was born, I basically, and I was brought up in my early days in a place called Gwanda. You know Gwanda? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Now, Gwanda was my first, basically, where I, where my feet touched the ground, really, because I was, as, as, as you know, very young, and because of the situation, as I'm told and as I remember, in Gwanda, with um, the Rhodesian Railways, they were using overseas expertise, like my dad, for instance, um, and they, I think they were pushing a line from Bulawayo through to Big Falls or whatever, and all these guys, these experts, they, they got involved in this uh, project. So in those days, I remember we were in Jarata, we were in little houses, Jarata matter the tin, and those old Rhodesian railways tin. Yes. yes. And I remember in Gwanda there was a power station and there was a, a store, but I was I was quite young then, and we used a lot of, if I remember, it was Shanghai labor. That's why I have got quite a good command of the Shanghai language. And I, I, I basically cut my teeth on being a mujiba, because I didn't, there wasn't much school, there was a little school here, I think, but I was more, um, I, I, I got into the Shanghai family's um, kids. Right. And I would, I would go out and we'd uh, herd the cattle and that sort of thing. This is what I remember, eh? And I was, uh, I was very young in those days, but my old man, he was a Scotsman, and um, he he enjoyed that, and he allowed me. There was no problem in those days, so I had um, good friends. They were my African um, uh, friends, and I would go out for a few days with these guys, as they did, herding cattle and so on. So that was me cutting my teeth into that type of environment, and of course. I um, grew um, grew very attached to this lifestyle. And I'll tell you something, and I might be mistaken on this, but they called me Chinochum Fudu, meaning right. us, us as young boys, young kids, I don't know, six, seven, eight, rolling around in the gang in looking after the old man's cattle. In the morning, you get a hard on. Okay, because I never had, I didn't have many, didn't have much clothes. I would just follow what they did. You know, we were all together. And me getting a hard on, uh, me being circumcised, 
look like a tortoise. <laughs> so, so I get my morning glory, like everybody did. Yeah, boarding school and all that. You walk around and brag about your morning glory. And out came this bloody tortoise head. <laughs> and that's how come I got the name. And I remember there's something, Mfudu, I think, is tortoise in, 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 uh, in um, Shanghai. And Chilocha uh, Mfudu, I don't know how that came, but anyway, I was, I was known by them as the tortoise because of, of my Jaloga. <laughs> so um, that is one funny side to it, right? And then as I grew up with these guys, things happened and the line, the rail line, was being pushed forward. This is all what I can remember what my dad told me, was pushed forward towards Big Falls. And on the way, we would set up camp and live on the line, basically, on the railway line. My dad became the station foreman and all that sort of thing. I had a sister. My sister was two years younger than me. And, um, and we used to hunt for the pot. My dad used to do that, and he used to manage basically the contract. So I, um, I had a good grounding with the African culture and the language. And today, even now, today, I, I, I don't forget that. I keep talking to myself, and I have a good friend on mic. He's a, he's a very good linguist with Zulu, so we often mess around and we talk. So I keep myself up to a level of, of of my tradition, which I call as a, a well, you obviously learned a lot of bushcraft that way, and learned how to trap yeah. as a youngster. Right? Absolutely, that's exactly right. And um, consequently, I wasn't really a scholar. And because education, as far as I can remember, was very limited as far as schools were concerned, the locomotive, which was a garret, would come out from Bulawayo, and would come out past Gwanda, Gwai, and going up to Vic Falls. Um, there would be occasions where I would be um, put on the train, or on, on the, yeah, on, 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 on the footplates with the garret, which I loved. And um, I think my mom would also go to Bulawayo when the steamer was going back to Bulawayo, and I suppose do a shopping. Then I went to School there on occasions, um, it was Milton Junior, Milton Junior School. And um, Mr. Page was the headmaster. It's funny how I remember his name. And because I was a bit of an odd fellow, um, I, was, I was a little bit, I was bullied really, because the Poms from the Second World War had immigrated to Rhodesia after the Second World War, had immigrated to Rhodesia, and they would occupy, they would go to school as, as scholars. And me being the odd bugger out, didn't want to wear shoes and so on, so on, so I'd be bullied quite a bit or, or teased, you know. And anyway, that was that side of the education side of me, which wasn't very good. My mom and dad divorced, and I went to a school called Jamison in Gatuma. And um, Things didn't do, go too well with me there. And then I thought, nah, there must be more to life than this. And they started to recruit for the police, the BSAP. And I joined as a cadet. And I loved my time in the, in, 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 in the police, two years, I think it was. But I never made it. I, 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 wasn't, wasn't, I wasn't set for that Lani life of the BSAP and all that. And... Um, I left school, I went to sea, I went to go look for my father overseas in Scotland, I just took off and found him in Aberdeen in Scotland, stayed some time there, then eventually came back to Rhodesia. At this time, we were, um, the Honda was going on, but a lot of gooks were, uh, was building up from Zambia and I joined 1st Battalion. And what I was doing is I would go to sea I'd spend, I don't know, six months in the Merchant Navy, come back, go into, do my call-up, which was at that time four and a half months, 
And the RLI at the time, they were recruiting a lot for RLI and SAS from the road cinema and all that sort of thing. And I wanted to join the SAS. And my mother said, no. I said, I want to join the RLI. RLI. She said, no. So consequently, I, she says, you must get the trade. <laughs> so I had to get the trade. So I thought I might get a trade at sea, which I did do, went back, kept coming back to Rhodesia and back. Anyway, um, the war started to escalate and that's when the call-up started to come and that's when I uh, started doing my call-ups in, in one or all. And the skills that they, the certain officers had noticed in me something that was different to the other povo that were doing their call-ups. And, um, and that was the tracking and the linguistic side of things when we were on, when we were going on a four and a half month camp. And that's really introduced me to the army. And I decided that one day I'll, uh, I'll probably end up joining the army. Served a trade at sea, became qualified, Worked as a tradesman in Rhodesia, and I was in Marindellis a long time. And um, then I was used, uh, I went to 4th Battalion Trackers, that's right, with Alf Leopard and all those guys. And um, I joined, I was with the tracking unit there, and I was in, uh, deployed as a tracker with 4th Battalion. And then while I was there, I was called up so much on call-ups, that I thought, no, man, I must uh, I'd rather become permanent. And that's when I uh, decided to try for Salute Scouts. And that's what I did. I did a selection, and I passed. And um, a guy who really pushed me was old Scott Donnellan. I don't know if you remember Scott Donnellan. Yes, I do. Um, he really pushed me. He saw... <laughs> He saw something in me on those selections, and he said to me, you've got to go for this. Anyway, he gave me a lot of encouragement, and, um, and I continued. And then I went for selection, past selection, and the rest is history as far as Salute Scouts were concerned. And, um, yeah, uh, what more can I say than that? Then I realized that there was a lot more to the Salute Scouts than, you know, and I, I carried on improving, I guess. Wally, you know um, better than I do that um, Ron Reed Daly was a very innovative commander and very open to ideas from, from any source, so no matter what rank. Um, he was a very good listener. And I know that you uh, and Ben Botha, I think, came up with a novel idea about how to draw a group of uh, the enemy into, into the open uh, at a time when you were having a problem finding them. You knew these groups were in the area, but you were having a hard time flushing them. Their security system, from what I gather, was very effective. And uh, you guys operating as pseudo guerrillas were, uh, were just not breaking through. So it was time for some for some new ideas, and I know you and Ben came up with a new idea. But but um, please talk us through what happened next. Okay, Anas, uh, what happened? Ben and I were on on a scene, and we were in a on a gormal, and we were just killing time, talking, and, and then. Um, being frustrated, I was so frustrated in um, the action, no action, I've got, we've got to get in. And I know there was a big problem of um, the scene or the area being so quiet. This, as far as I can remember, was so quiet. And um, because there was um, civilians being abducted, at the time, like the one youngster was abducted from that petrol tanker. And there was another woman that was abducted 
and, and pushed across the border in a wheelbarrow. And Ben and I were just talking generally, and, and, and we came up with this idea of maybe we should do that, you know. And we, we, he was chuffed, and because he was my boss, I was happy that he was happy, and he said to me, Wally, I'm going to Salisbury. I want to go and discuss this with the boss. And um, what happened after that, I don't know what, what the depths of the whole plan went in with Ben when he saw the boss, but uh, I was left there and uh, carried on with the scene. It was then discussed with me, and I was happy to be the abductee. And we came up with a plan, and I think um, Ben and, 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 and his bosses might have come up with a scene and we did quite a quite a quite a realistic thing because um i think the first abduction was bite bridge and i was to be a um a game ranger and um i know the africans there um they didn't really like the game ranger because he was basically protecting yeah stop what they felt shouldn't be protected. <laughs> yeah. So um, we set up this thing. I'm, I'm trying to think of names who Ben was dealing with at the time. And I know the Zumba farm, it was a ranch, big ranch. And Ben had, had set up a, an abduction scene whereby the vehicle was stopped. Um, the game ranger was abducted. They killed his wife and children. And this was to authenticate the um, situation as it was to the locals. In other words, to confirm to the locals that, hey, these, these guys are comrades. I was then, then put into the scene and I was deployed with my call sign. It, it, it so happened that <laughs> within hours, within hours, we had contact with interested parties. You you are the game ranger. You've been abducted. You with your black pseudo group, who are the, the gorillas, and yep. you, are, you are their captive. Yep. So, so now you you I assume you 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 bound up, you handcuffed uh, whatever, and you're now being taken through yep. the area. And they are transmitting the word that this is the white man, the white game ranger that they've that they've captured. Yeah, no, no. And uh, what had happened? I tell you, within hours, Anus, um, we had started to have feedback. And um, as I remember, we were going along. I was bound, and I said to my guys, I, I had a feeling. And thinking about it now, I don't think my guys were that experienced. Um, but then, who was? Um, they were rookies. And I don't think they really knew how to play, how to act the part. Mm -hmm. I was there, yeah. and they had to follow me. And I just, I said to them, listen, guys, I'm bothered here now. We've got to go and we've got to get these guys. And within hours, we had a reaction from a lady, uh, from a, one of the African ladies who, if I can remember right, it came and approached us. And, and of course, they sold me to her. And she went off and she said, I know there's a group of guys just down the road here who wants to see you. So she went off. And that was the contact. That that was that was the breakthrough that we needed. And um, she came back, as far as I can remember, and said, "Yep, yeah, people are interested. You've got a you've got a Mlungu there, who now is a capture. And this is a big thing. This was a big thing because a lot of those a lot of those Africans in those, in that area had never seen a white man." We'd never seen a white person so close. <laughs> this, this addition will come in as I'm talking. 
And um, I'm trying to, because there were two abductions, and I was on them both, I'm, I, 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 I might be mixing, I might be mixing my memory in with both of them, but however, they're all the same. Two, two gooks approached us. They were coming. And they, this female, I think, said, look, there's a group not far from here. They know you've got this in Lungu. They want to meet with you. They want to come and see you. So we said, oh, okay. I couldn't, I, you know, I said to the guys, hey, we onto something here, man. So get your acting shoes on and let's, let's act the proper part here. Yeah. I'll do the acting. You just do your thing. They came. These two guys came. And they wanted to buy a letter. And um, unfortunately, and one of my guys who was an RPG, who held an RPG-7, I think he just couldn't believe what was going on. He just let fly with his RPG-7 and, and hit the guy point blank range. The, one of the two guys that were, were coming to meet with us, to take us to the group, hit him straight in the chest, RPG-7. So... Um, I said, <laughs> now you've compromised us. And I, I said, look, guys, let's just take cover. Let's let's think about this. And I got them together and I said, right. We are guys with the European. Let us pretend now that the guy who we shot, who you just told now, is a Skuzapu. Because they knew about Skuzapu <laughs> and they were scared of Skuzapu in the area. So I said, well, what we'll do We'll buy our letter and we'll put it on the body. Say, you yeah, bloody screws up with this, this, this. I can't remember exactly what that. That's it. The guy that we shot, he was a screws up and we weren't going to be fooled and we nailed him. Right. Now that set us right into the, in, in, into the scenario. Hey, and the poor boy, they loved us. So we got fed and we were taken here and there and there and there everywhere. Because I was scrub. I can tell you I was scrub. We were all scrub. They, they weren't feeding you. They were feeding your captors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the thing is, Hannes, while I was, um, we were new to this. And while I was going along with the scene, these guys weren't looking after me so much. My own, my own guys. They were worried about the chipompis they were going to get to them, the beer they were going to get them, the chicken and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and I said to them, listen, guys, remember who's here. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to keep me alive. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, shit. Sure, okay, shit. Sure. No, they, anyway. they're, getting, they're getting women. They're getting beer. They're getting everything. Beer. Last, last, everything, last <laughs> everything, and of course, um, I'm the one that's sort of forgotten about, basically, you know. And you, and you you're sitting there with your hands tied up, yes. <laughs> so I said to them, I said, Now, listen, hang on, you got you gotta, you gotta think of me now, but a little bit, yeah. Uh, but we also had to act the part, and they had to be aggressive towards me, and all that sort of thing. So I carried on acting the story, and um, we were we were taken from one place to another place to another place. But we were becoming so popular because there's a rule. And as I said, the people in the area had never seen a European um, so close, you know? And they would touch me, and they would come up, and they'd... But my guys, being inexperienced, didn't emphasize the fact that they are the comrades. They're the ones that must take control. They're the ones that must dictate who does what and what does what. So I told them when I could. I said to them, listen, you guys are the comrades. You're the ones, you're the guys of the power, not the poor boy. The poor boy just, you know. So take control here. So basically, I had to coach them with that. Anyway, um, as we were going along, things happened. And then 
I'm trying to think at what part, as I was being, as I was being transported through the system, I must say one thing about the Gooks and the locals. Their security was really good. I remember there was a group of guys who wanted to meet us. And I thought, boy, this is it. We've, we've cracked it, yeah. Now, now we can really get in. And me being a European, didn't have to um, duck and dive a bit because my, my, my troop, my, 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 my group, were gooks. And they were, they were accepted by the locals. And so we had free range, except that uh, I had to be very careful on how things were. We, we came into an area where the locals surrounded us. And they now wanted to speak to me now. And this is where the shit hit the fan for me. Because um, these, these oaks, they, this is a new thing. This is a rule here, you see. Um, let's ask him questions. So they started to ask me a lot of questions about the government and about the army and about my wife and about my dead kids and all that sort of thing. And then that's when the aggression started. And this is where my guys let me down. <laughs> These locals showed me and I said to them, guys, I said, listen, I know I'm acting, but geez, you know, you, you, you've got to look after me here. Anyway, um, they, they, they tried to manage things in a way that didn't look too suspicious about, you know, he's being protected too much, you know what I mean? So I had to be shy, and they 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 kicked me, and they hit me with all sorts of things, and but the locals now started to get a bit brave, and this is where my guys, unfortunately, started to slacken, and they roared at me. These guys roared at me, boy. They kicked me. They then I was stripped with all my clothes. Then I had to act like a, like a pig. And I had to, if they fed me, they, they threw the food on the ground. And I had to snort like a pig and, and bark like a dog and lift my leg. And they, then they started to get aggressive. And I said to my guys, listen, I'm getting taken out here. Just, be, just please look after me. Anyway, they beat the hell out of me, Hannes. They beat the hell out of me. They today I'm suffering still from those from those um, from the beatings that I had. And um, there were two guys. Okay, now we had to meet. And and I was crook, so I put my, my, my rifle was hidden next near me in, in a bush and my webbing. And I needed that close by. I said to the guys, I've got to have my rifle next to me. So while they were robbing me like hell, a, a female, a woman, came up and she started to say, Ha! You are, you are, the, you are the boss, eh? You are the boss. And she started to imitate a European lady. I'm the Italian boy. You are telling me this, you are telling me that. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. And um, she started to imitate this, this European lady. And um, uh, uh, causing, causing a problem. And, and with, with the crowd, with the poor that had surrounded me, they were all getting agitated. And they were thinking this was fantastic. And she'd come up and she'd give me a hell of a club, you know. And uh, then each and every one of them wanted to give me a club too. But I said to my guys, listen, I've had enough clubs now, man. You've got to start showing a little bit of um, force here. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I said to the guys, look, I, I need to talk to you some more. Otherwise, I'm going to, I tell you, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get serious here. Then I'm in. Then one of us are going to waffle here. Anyway, so I found the opportunity to get taken away to go to the toilet, and I said to the guy, 
as I said, listen, um, I'm not feeling too well at the moment. Um, we have to prove to these guys that you are the bosses. Not them, because at the moment they've taken over. And you are the comrades that control this whole thing. So I'm the captive, and they've got what they want. So just tell the rest of the comrades that that's the story. Okay? So then they got the message from me. And um, then um, we heard that there was a, a group of gooks that were not far from where we were at this time. And um, my one guy of danger, he came to me and he said to me, he was a political commissar, and he said to me, look, we've got, we've got a group right, right here, right here. And they want to meet you. They want to see you. And they want to see us. So we've got to prove ourselves that we are the, we are the local group. We're not squeezed up because they didn't trust us. So uh, authenticate was the word I was trying to think of. Um, so I said, no, okay, um, let's get into position because I think there's a problem here. So two guys, uh, the woman came, this, this bloody woman, I'll never forget her. She's no longer with us. But anyway, she came and she, she was the one that really started. She was very, very uh, aggressive. aggressive towards me, hated me, <laughs> aggressive, man. And, um, and I had her in my sights. Right, yeah, I had it in my sights. And I thought, yeah, okay. So anyway, while we were there, I'm trying to think now, while, we, while I was there sitting naked like a pig, um, making noises like a pig, having to eat what they gave me, which I didn't want to particularly eat. I had to eat like a pig. I had to eat like a dog. I had to, you know, all that sort of thing. They were really demeaning me. Two guys approached, one with an RPD, one with an RPG-7. And they came to see me. I then realized that things weren't right. And I said to my guys, hey, just get into statue positions. And while they were walking towards me, I said, because there were some mombies. They were pushing mombies through through this uh, area where we were. And I said, I, I positioned my guys and I said, prepare for an ambush. Prepare for a contact right now. And um, anyway, this, this, this female, she was there and she was carrying on like anything. And then these two guys approached, as I said, RPD and RPG-7. And the mummies were coming through. And while I was there, in that position, no clothes on, and my and I knew where my rifle was. Um, I then prepared myself for close contact. And what happened was these guys came up, and I saw the look on their faces. They were absolutely chuffed. The fact that there was a Mlungu there, they captured a Mlungu. And they, they came in, and uh, Ian Waller, the scout guy, he was about 5Ks north of me, say, for instance. And um, I later heard that it was Ian Waller. He had a contact. And as these guys were coming in to see me, this contact took place with Ian Waller. And hearing the shots, these guys lifted their weapons because they came in, the weapons at, uh, yeah, and then as the shots took place, up came the weapons, the RPD and the RPG-7. That's when I decided, now, nah. I dived into the bush and grabbed my weapon and eliminated them both. It's, it's, I don't know how I did it, but that's happened. Point blank range. And, um, and that set off a contact like you won't believe. Because what had happened, these guys had planned to come in 
to take me, take out my 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 call sign, and they were walking in with mombies. They were hidden behind cattle. And as they were driving the cattle through my position, they were behind the cattle. And of course, the contact upset their plans. And I, uh, having to dispatch those two guys by chance, the contact took place like you won't believe. And <laughs> there was just close firing from our guys and their guys. How my guys um, didn't get mixed up with their guys, I'm bugging if I know, because that's how close it was. And then, and then, of course, everybody gapped it. Ian Waller's group, I think it picked up all the movement that you generated. They were on an OP, and they picked up okay. all the movement, and that's what they then reacted to. So, you know, it was only oh, okay. it was because of the groups all coming. To I never really knew what happened. You know, um, as I said, I was just the guy there and the sound of that contact those guys were very concerned about it so they their reaction was to automatically lift their weapons and i took that opportunity and i fortunately my weapon was pretty close they were all inter intermingled and i and i grabbed my weapon and i just rolled and fortunately i don't know where i got the skills from but i dispatched them both and um, of course, our lady friend as well. Wally, did you? Have to go Everybody to... just took the gap, and my guys also took the gap. <laughs> and I was there sitting with no clothes on, looking for something to to wear. And then um, we then followed up. That's right, we did a follow up, and um, there was a lot of blood spore. And eventually, I called in SB. I think, but it's a, a while ago, you know, it's a while ago that I was sick. Eh? That day I was sick and I was taken back to Cherenzi. Can I go back to the second abduction? Yes. Because what had happened with the second abduction was we were off to shot in Chicago. This was, to me, this was the, the big event for me. And this is where our friend, Bert Sachs, comes in. Shot in Chidoro was a guy who was a fancy boy. He was educated. Apparently he knew a lot about medics. And of course I took up the the um, the, the pose as, as an injured injured uh, railway worker or whatever it was. I was a pauvre and I was very, very sick. I was hurt and I was bleeding and I was this and that. Now Shelton Chidoro wanted me to take me back to Mozambique. And um, the locals wanted to hand me over to Shelton um, so that they would get the benefits of the, the, the groups in the area or the nice. comrades of the area. Yeah. So um, I, was, I was helped along. I was helped along. We were fed and all that sort of thing, but we had to be very careful about our not compromising ourselves. So Shelton and Chidoro were heard. And this is where the SAS came in. Because this is in Mazunga, Mazunga Ranch, and I think you know Mazunga Ranch. Mm -hmm. And I think Daryl Watt also knows Mazunga Ranch. Um, uh, we, were, we were pushed through, pushed through, pushed through. And the same thing happened, the beatings took place and um, I had to, we had to be very careful, we didn't compromise ourselves. And then Shelton Chidoro was in the, was, was in the area and knew about me. And because he was a medic and he really would have gone up in the ranks if he'd taken me back to Mozambique and patched me up and everything like that, he would have been hurt by them. But anyway, I'm, I'm trying to cut things short here when eventually we got into an area where there were about 200, 200 pauvre. And they'd heard about this uh, room that this group had got and we authenticated ourselves in the market. And um, I was paraded in front of this group of 
a problem. And I can't remember the reason why, but I said to my group, get me out of here. Get me to the top of that gorma. There's a little copy. Okay. And um, I was taken up to this copy. And um, the locals wanted me, they wanted to take me out, kill me. And there was a, they wanted to decapitate me. And one woman came up with a plow. She wanted to take my neck off. And um, they, um, they wanted to make an issue about this. So, that, so my guys, I said to my guys, look, I'm not well. Eh? They've, they've beaten me quite a bit now. Take me back up to this, to this gobble and you deal with me. And the, and the poor boy were being very, very, very uh, cheeky. And I said to my guys, look, you, you guys are <coughs> comrades, not those guys. Look after me. Anyway, and they took me up there. And then the poor decided, no, we want to kill this guy. We want to cut him up, kill him, bring him down here. We'll look after him. So my guys said no. So they took me up to the school and um, we, we came up with a plan, we had a plan to say, look, you tell these people that you're dealing with me, not them. So you will kill me. Okay? So that so what they did is they put me under a blanket, shot some shots in the air, and um, he, they then passed the message on to the – there they were. I could see them down the bottom there. There must have been about 200 of them. If you get 10, 20, 30, 50, 50, 60, you could work out how many people were there. Anyway, um, they then wanted to see the body. So uh, they said to me, what do we do now? I said, well, you'll have to cover me with a blanket and let them come up. But we're going to have to cut this short somehow. So um, they covered me with a body. Uh, they covered me with a blanket. And they brought a couple of guys up to have a look at this, this corpse. But I was under the blanket. And then they started to say, no, 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 we want to see the corpse. We want to cut his finger off and we want to cut this off and cut that off and take it down to the people. Now the people were beginning to chant. Eh? And I thought to myself, I, I can't remember how many guys there was, maybe 10 of us or something like that. And these oaks were getting cheeky. Now they wanted to see this in Melbourne now. Because they wanted to hack him up. So um, they... Uh, so I said to my guys, no, 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 you'll deal with me. But that's when I got with the radio. I got on to Cheredzi. And I spoke to, I don't know, somebody in the ops room there. And I needed to speak to the Sunray, which happened to be um, our friend. And um, spoke to the Sunray. I think I spoke to the Sunray. And I, I, demanded a fire force reaction. reaction to me being caught in this situation, whereby if the fire force had come out as a fire force, they don't have to know what they're coming out to. They're just going to be called out from Chiridzi. And if they um, initiated a contact with, it, with the locals, my guys who were still there, would have still been okay. They wouldn't have been compromised. And they would have dispatched, they would have run with the locals. And um, I would refuse that, um, which pissed me off because I tell you, I was sore and I'd worked hard to get there. And one chopper, and it's been documented in other, in other books and stories that I've read, that fire force came out. That didn't happen. One chopper arrived and it landed near the Gormo. And um, I got up, I had to get up, I was uplifted. All of a sudden this dead oak has come alive into the chopper and flown away. And that's what compromised my call sign in that area. And that's what pissed me off yes. about that whole thing. And you know, it wasn't easy to get accepted, but when you did get accepted, there was a blown. So that was that story. And, I sh and, and, and just before I was uplifted, a letter came through 
from Shelton Chidoro to say that we are ready to meet your call, son. We are ready to meet you. But I was taken away by the job. So unfortunately, the whole thing was bad. But that was that side of it. And I was taken back to Turkey, patched up and whatever. <laughs> It's a terrible story. So, 